this service. Um, for those of you who are not able to come to church, welcome to this virtual service. Um, we're going to lead you in a few songs with the team and we just pray that you, together with us, will worship in one accord and give the best of adoration to our Lord Jesus. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart come. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart come. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Feel me come, feel 
Especially the fathers, actually the fathers, a happy Father's Day. I have a scripture here, right here with me. Um, let's read. Uh, Second Corinthians six eighteen, and this is a promise from the Lord. It says, "And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me." says the Lord Almighty. I pray that even as we celebrate fathers, that we will not forget to celebrate the, the main man right now, the Father, our Lord. He promises to be our Father. So as we worship, I just want to wish every man a happy Father's Day. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they Think your life, and I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know.
that? My daddy. What's his name? Daddy. <laughs> What's something that Dad really loves to do? Do Instagram. Read the stories and sing a song. What makes Daddy special? When I get stuck on my homework, he helps me. He does good voices. When I'm sad, he cheers me up. And he gives me a lot of kisses and huggies. Growing up and getting ready to become a dad, you're told all these things. You learn things about yourself. Patience, responsibility, love, so cliche, but it's, it's, so, it's so true. It's, it, everything's about your children now. I never thought you could love someone that much, so. Yeah, keeps surprising me every day. This is how you laugh. <laughs> no, Dad. <laughs> Who's your favorite superhero? Uh, my dad. <laughs> <laughs> You look like a superhero. A rainbow superhero. I look like a rainbow superhero? Mm -hmm. Oh wow, thank you. Actually, you know what's my favorite thing? No, you. No, no. you. <laughs> oh, no. Ready? Ready to do the mad dad face together? One. Hit the look over there. Ready? One, two, three. Hi there, my name is Vixel and I serve in the youth ministry here at Christian Life Assembly. We believe that one of the strategies to help reach the young people and the leadership is to have heart-to-heart -heart conversations on matters of the youth and to seek solutions towards them. It is to that effect that I invite all young adults in Christian Life Assembly for a coffee moment with the senior pastor on Sunday 27th of June at 3 p.m. right here in the CLA Auditorium. We will send out a link to all our WhatsApp groups as well as our youth groups for you to be able to attend this event. We hope to see you there. Here are our weekly events. On Tuesdays, we are now meeting in person for prayer meetings from 6 p.m. to 7.30. Cells gather on Wednesdays on different virtual platforms. Make sure that you connect with your cell members so that you fellowship with them every Wednesday. Tune in to our Sunday services at 10 a.m. Make sure you subscribe to CLA Rwanda on YouTube and click the notification button so that you never miss out every time there's a service. Our kids services happen every Sunday at 12 p.m. The link is provided through the WhatsApp groups. Our True North services happen every Sunday at 11.30 to 1 p.m. at Wellspring Academy. On Fridays, the intercessors are able to also meet and if you want to be part of that, make sure that you let us know through the WhatsApp groups so that you're added to that platform. For more information, visit claronda.org. Follow us and like us on social media. Thank you for watching.
Greetings CLA, my name is Pastor David Wagat and I'm excited to be sharing the Word of God with us on this Father's Day. Uh, I'm glad to be in Kigali again after quite a long of a break, but God has been good to us, God has kept us safe and excited to speak to us about the place of fatherhood. And we'll be studying the story of one man from the Old Testament called Nehemiah. Nehemiah is an amazing uh, leader. In fact, many leadership gurus have talked about Nehemiah and used his model on, and strategy as something to just inspire men and women across the world on matters of leadership. But he is also a father. And so I want us to look at Nehemiah as a father. Um, the book of Nehemiah begins with these words. The chapter 1 of Nehemiah says, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came to Jeru from Jerusalem, from Judah, with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant the, that survived exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. What sad news to come from home. And I just want us to reflect on the story that begins to unfold here. And the Bible talks about Nehemiah's response. And the Bible says he sat down and wept. And for some days he went without food, moaned and fasted and prayed before God of the God of heaven. And then he made a prayer to God. And we all know that famous prayer that Nehemiah makes. And in the, within that prayer, a number of things that we see is, first of all, um, he reminds God of his covenant of love. He reminds God of what he has done for Israel before. He reminds God of what he had made an agreement with the people of Israel and says, you know what, if, the people, if my people who are called my name, will, my, my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And he took on the form of one of those who said, I will turn away I will begin to cry out to God. Rather than say, those people have sinned. I am doing well. I'm the cup bearer. I am settled. Says, let me take on the sin of my people and pray and stand in the gap for them. Why? Because that is one of the things that a father, a man does. He doesn't give up responsibility. He takes responsibility. Well, we've all heard all these subtle statements about manhood, about fathers. And I know many of us have stories. If you were to ask about the stories of fathers and our experiences, we could write books across this world. And questions like, what happened to real men? What happened to men like Nehemiah, who would not take their position as their, their end game and put it aside and say, I need to go and make a difference in my community? The absent father is a current mystery. Uh, possibly more endangered are men or fathers than many species of animals. And unlike the animal species, people are not interested <laughs> in restoring a healthy fatherhood or a healthy manhood anymore. It's like, let's replace these guys because they're not doing well. And yes, there have been messes that have come out of the men in this world. We have a very consumerist culture where if something doesn't work, we do away with it and replace it with another thing. Unfortunately, we are trying to do this with fatherhood. We are trying to do this with man manhood. We are trying to do this. And the world is pushing to say, if a man doesn't show up, then set him aside and life goes on. If, if men don't do what they need to do, put them aside. Is the remedy to fix it? Yes, we have stories about fathers gone bad. We have tears that, have brought, that they have brought into our lives. And so it seems a good reason to get rid of, our, of them. But is it? And the question that I want to ask us is, what is fatherhood? What is fatherhood? While we see semblances of fatherhood in different scriptures and in different uh, stories in life, some good stories, we rarely understand what the full picture of fatherhood is. While the world is struggling to come to terms with the challenge of fatherlessness, we have no clarity as to what fatherhood is all about. And so we are thinking, we are, there's, there's all these children being born with, without their fathers. A fatherless generation, some people have called it. In a research done in South Africa, they talked about how 
uh, the, the crisis of fatherlessness has become a pandemic of sorts. And we ask ourselves, so, yes, we know that there's been a lot of fatherlessness around us, but what is fatherhood? Is it provision? What if the one who provides loses his job? Is it protection? What if they're not the strongest one in the building? Is it priesthood? What if they are not as prayerful as the mother or as the other people are? Is it pleasure? Are we looking for someone who will make us happy? Is it presence? Availability for the family, for the community, for the nation? Is it procreation? Just somebody who makes somebody pregnant? Or is it participation? Being involved in the lives of the family, of the community, of the nation. And so all these things give us a picture, a slight picture of what fatherhood is. But why is it that the lack of fathers, the, the, the fatherlessness is such a crisis? Why is it that such diverse, such adverse effect is seen? Come with me. <laughs> and let's look at what the challenge of fatherlessness is posing in some places in this world. Even as we think of replacing fathers, think of replacing men in many ways, and I'll speak for men today because I think today we, this is a day to celebrate fathers, and we just want to look at what is going on around us. Why is it that the young men today don't seem as confident as they were? I work a lot with young people, and I can tell you for every confident young man, I can show you five confident girls. Why? Because for the last 20 some years, there's been a push to set aside this young man because of the history of male chauvinism, because of the history of the mistakes of their fathers. And so it's almost like somebody's father makes a mistake, but because he's untouchable, we come and point at the child who has just been born and criminalize them for the sin of their father. And we say that in many ways. Listen to some of these statistics because numbers don't lie. Why is it that even when we have tried to say, you know what, we can go on without men, we can go on without the father figure, we can go on without, without husbands, without brothers. And this is what is showing in results of research is done. And this is not just South Africa, this is not just Kenya, this is not just the US, this is not just uh, Rwanda, this is across the globe. They say this about um, some of the effects of fatherlessness. Number one. 63% of suicides come from fatherless homes. 63% of suicides. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions, that is those young people who have become so delinquent that they have been put into, into protection of the state, come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists motivated by displaced anger come from fatherless homes. 40% of all children do not live with their biological fathers. That's a huge number. 85% of children with behavioral problems come from father, fatherless homes. Imagine, 85, this is probably <laughs> amongst the highest effects of fatherlessness. Behavioral problems, be it, you know, just uh, delinquent behavior in school, be it just acting violent, be it going into drugs, be it going into alcohol abuse, be it going into certain behaviors that are uncanny, 85% come from fatherless homes. 90% of homes, homeless children come from fatherless homes. Of course, that speaks of the need for provision from the father. 71% of children who do not finish school come from fatherless homes. Now, I want you to look at this and ask yourself, why is it, if really the father is not a necessity, if really the father is not an, a, a, an area to be addressed with urgency, why is it that the effect is so adverse? In fact, they said initially, <laughs> when I was looking at this research, I've always thought that the mother gives a picture of womanhood to the, ma to the daughter, and the father gives a picture of manhood to the son. But they say that, the, the fatherless, fa they say fatherlessness causes a, 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 a distortion in the development of manhood in boys and womanhood in girls. And I was like, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. How, do I, how does a girl pick up womanhood from a man? But that is what the research shows. 
And so when we ask ourselves, what is fatherhood? We're not asking ourselves in order to try and redeem a certain posture that the man has had. We are asking this question because we are seeing the effect of it on sons and daughters, on nations and communities alike. When the man is taken out of the picture, a story changes. Whenever we saw God doing something in the Bible, the devil would attack. And many times he would not just attack the child, he would attack the boy child. When Moses was being born, all the male children were being killed. When Jesus was being born, all the children were being killed. Why? Because the enemy knows that if he strikes this, this, this gender, he's had it with the rest of them. You see, fatherhood begins in the cradle. Every time we see a picture of a man holding his child's hand, the first thought in our minds is that the, the man is the father and this is the dependent. But the reality is that in that journey, manhood, fatherhood is being taught is being translated into this young person's life. The next generation of fathers is being formed. And the Bible says very clearly, train up a child in the way, not train up an adult, train up a child in the way he should go. And after that, he will not depart from it. And so the place to fix fatherhood is not in the boardroom. It's not in the work environment. It's in the cradle. It's in name. What are the fathers giving to the children at this time? What are the mothers giving to the children at this time? You see, many of us are trying to fix fatherlessness rather than fix fatherhood. We're trying to find out how do we cope with the fact that fathers are not at home rather than try and find out why are they, are they why are fathers not home? What is it that is within the genome of the man that is causing them to go rather than be present where they need to be? If we fix fatherhood, we will fix fatherlessness. And this is not about just saying, oh, we will have no children born out of wedlock. We will have no children born uh, without their father's presence to raise them up. But when, when we fix fatherhood, fathers will emerge from the community. Boys who have no fathers will find men in community who will be able to show them this is the way, walk in it. Girls who have no fathers will be able to find teachers who will sit with them and show them this is what it means to be a woman. Neighbors will rise up and become fathers. Pastors will rise up and become fathers. Mentors will come up, fellow students. In fact, one of the disciplines that we were taught in school is that when the first year students come in, the second, third year, fourth year students take them on as mentors. Why? Because they are teaching them how to walk the ropes of campus. And they are learning to be fathers before they meet their first girlfriend. Why? Because they, that is where they learn the ropes. Nehemiah looks at what is happening in Jerusalem and says, it's not possible for me to be a man of calling, a man of means, a man with access to the king, and not be able to do something about it. But the easiest thing for us to do is just ignore. And when we ignore the role of the, the, taking on the responsibility to do something with, about the fathers, or take the shortcut of saying, do away with them, replace them. And we've tried to replace them with many things. I, I could talk about a lot of things that have tried to replace fatherhood, but there is no time for that. Because I want to come in and just talk about Nehemiah as a man who God has called out. And things have begun to happen because a man has taken the role of a father. The first thing that we see that Nehemiah does is that he takes on responsibility. Not just for himself, but for the sins of his nation. He takes on and says, you know what, we have sinned. See, fatherhood is birthed in ownership. Just because you're not directly responsible does not mean it does not affect you. And I want to call fathers and men to rise up and say we will be able to stand up and own that even which we are not responsible for. It grows in compassion. When Nehemiah had this news, his heart was moved. He began to pray, find answers on his knees. We're talking about a spiritual man, talking about raising spiritual men, men who can go on their knees and say, this one, I cannot, 
but oh God, you can. Many times we as men don't like asking for directions. No wonder Google decided Google Maps will have a woman giving directions. <laughs> the sarcasm of life. Because they know how we hate getting instructions, especially from our wives. And the reason why we don't pray much might be because we don't want to get instructions from God. And when we break that order, then the man wants to take the place of God and begin to lord it over others because we cannot handle that level of authority. And so Nehemiah realizes, if I don't go on my knees and begin to work my means, I will look for the, a way of fixing things that does not involve me. Dear men, let us get involved. Let us get our hands dirty. Number three, manhood or fatherhood is fixed with strategy. Nehemiah does not just say, oh king, I am sad, send me, let me go and fix my nation. No, no, no. He sits down and, he, and says, I need to know exactly what I need for this. And when the king asks him what he needs, he does what they call the elevator pitch. In a few minutes, he says, this is what I need. I need to go back home and, and for a time. Before the king says, fine, you can go back home, he says, but also... Can I have letters? <laughs> because apart from having a good strategy, you need to have good policy. And many times as men, we don't think about policy. And where we have lost our, our children and our children's children is because we sit as good men and say, ours is to pray for the people. Ours is to intercede. Ours is to stand in the gap. But we don't realize that in standing in the gap, we need to be able to have policies that support family. In some countries in the West, after messing up their family units, they have now reached a place where they say, if a father is moved or transferred to another part of the nation, the mother must agree in written consent. If not, that company will be sued and they will pay damages to the family because they are trying to separate the family. Right? Because they realized probably a tad too late that we needed to protect and safeguard family. And so the, Nehemiah says, may I also have letters to the governors of trans euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Esaf, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber. He's moved from getting permission, he's moved to getting resources. And so he's thinking strategically, he's thinking, what do I need? And sometimes when we look at ourselves as men, we think we have everything within ourselves. Nehemiah knew he didn't have everything within himself. There were other men who had these things. But he needed the man at the top to say, here, here's the letter. And because he knew or sensed that there would be opposition, let me tell you the battle against manhood is huge. From left, right, center, the war against the man is huge. But we are not going to give up. We are not going to faint. We are not going to say it is okay. Let us do it. We need to stand up as men because if we do not stand up, and I like telling people, if, if we fail at fathering the next generation, it doesn't matter what else we do. It doesn't matter how much education we give them. It doesn't matter how many good roads we build for them. It doesn't matter how much wealth we put in their hands. If we fail to father the next generation, we have failed. Is it no wonder that God introduces himself as the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, a generational father. Is it not for that reason that Jesus says, you have been given a name. What is one of the things that a father gives to his children? A name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. And so in this narrative, we see Nehemiah take the role of a father and draw other fathers to restore the city of Jerusalem. My prayer today is that God will help us as men to rise up. In the midst of the battles, in the midst of the opposition, in the midst of all the things that are going on around us, to rise up as men and say, we will stand. We will, we will, we will own our sin. We will own our mistakes, we will own our, our, our nation's mistakes, and we will be able to go on our knees and say, God, give us a chance. 
We will be able to grow this in prayer. We will get on our knees and pray. We have to be spiritual men because if we do not become spiritual men and we, have, we are not answering to anyone, then we begin to answer to ourselves and we make idols of ourselves. We need to fix the strategy. We need to think strategically about the next generation. Giving birth is not an end game. In fact, it's the minimum entry point to becoming a father, bearing a child. It is thinking about what do I want to train up this child to be. We need to hold the swords like Nehemiah and his men. He said in chapter 4 verse 16, As you go to work, put on a sword on one side and carry your tool on the other. Ready to build and ready to protect. Our children must know that we are ready to build a future to the, for them, but also protect them. We as men were not called to cold out, to freak out, to be afraid, but to stand up and be counted as men of valor. We need to influence the place of policy. And I know I'm speaking to men of influence in this city. Speak to those places of policy. Don't just accept things because they are acceptable. Don't just say it because it is current, it is more than knowledge. Take it and put it into the world. And I know that it will be completed by dedication. It is not easy, but it is doable. May the Lord help us to become the fatherhood that, has that will change a generation. Father, we thank you and we bless you for each and every man, every boy, <laughs> every toddler who is watching us today. That, Lord, you would call us, call us out as men to become fathers. Call us out as men to stand in the place where, God, you called us to. Lord, not because we can, but because we must. Not because we are able to, but because you are able to use us. Lord, I know that many are the people who have given up on the thought of becoming fathers or fatherhood and having responsible men, the kind of men that we see in your word. Father, I pray that you would cause us to rise up and be those men. Let your spirit speak to us. Let your spirit change our attitude. Let your spirit stir us up again. Lord, let us hear those reports and may they stir us up to prayer, stir us up to action, stir us up to set aside our position of privilege so that we can go to our position of calling. We give you glory and we give you honor. For this we pray, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.